Did you know Scooby-Doo has been in more films than Chris Pratt, Kevin James and Joe Pesci? Been near enough 50 years since he and his gang were first unveiled together before the eyes of my granddad. I don't think he was watching though to be honest. He probably had more important things to do. And in that time, spanning live action, straight to home video, TV and theatrical releases, Scoop has starred in a whopping 45 motion pictures. The good, the bad and the unviewed by me span far and wide over the course of the last half century. But Scoop Scoob has, seemingly, when counting in his TV appearances as well, done it all. He's been to space, thwarted the resurrection of an ancient elder god responsible for all evil, and even been to Scotland. The world's most famous Great Dane certainly has a storied career on the box. But what about gaming? What about gaming, eh? You all know I sod in love gaming, and I've covered a couple of Scooby-Doo games on this channel which I grew up with over the past couple of Christmases. But let's stop for a second. PS2 is my home field. But did you know it? actually wasn't my first console. Okay, well it was my first console, as in the first one that was specifically bought for me, but the console that I experienced first was actually the PS1. Between playing a family member's console at my grand's every Sunday to try the likes of Crash 2, Casper and Chicken Run, or my dad's to watch him play what I believe was Alien Trilogy and Crash 3 myself, the PS1 was my first exposure to gaming within the home. I don't know if when my mum bought the console for my dad that she knew what room would be brought upon her son, but oh well, here we are. Before Crash 3, I didn't really tend to play games on the console, aside from Disney stuff like Tarzan, A Bug's Life or The Emperor's New Groove with my cousin. And typically though, he'd be doing most of the playing and I'd be taking on the majority of the watching. I was just a little baby boy, what am I meant to do in Patches on the Hunt? If you try and follow me, there'll be trouble. It wasn't until I owned the likes of Monsters Inc. Scare Island that I'd start taking matters into my own hands, and alongside playing that and Crash 3, I also acquired this game, Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, the video game tie-in for the most recent Scooby-Doo film available at the time. As is hopefully well established at this point, I was a huge enthusiast for Scooby-Doo as a young boy, and around the time I was growing up is still considered to be quite a blessed time in the history of the series, as while the live action film was still on the horizon, the animated side of things had been experiencing a massive boom, thanks to Japan based studio Mook Animations. The studio, having struck a four film deal with Warner Brothers between 1998 and 2001, would go on to release four of the most revered animated features in the history of the series. The first of these films, Scooby Doo on Zombie Island, is still the most highly regarded, with the visuals and plots still holding up incredibly well. The following year, they'd release peak autumnal vibes with Scooby Doo and the Witch's Ghost Witch, while while embodying the coziness that comes with Halloween and autumn as a whole, also altered the brain chemistry of an entire generation of people by debuting the Hex Girls. Following good times with goth girls and witchcraft, our eyes turned to the skies during a scorching desert summer in Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders. This one's often viewed as the weakest, but out of the four, it's still probably my favourite, both for the subject matter being extraterrestrials and for the fact that Shaggy is pretty much the main character in this one. It's similar to how Vel feels like more of a focus in Witch's Ghost. Then there's the final of the four films, 2001 Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase. This one is typically pretty fondly remembered, with many people ranking the films like this. However, as time has gone on, I think this film is the one that begins to falter the most, having the flimsiest plot and looking noticeably less well animated than the others. And to be fair to the studio, it must have been a pretty heavy task to keep up with the high bar of quality set by the previous films, which I'd personally rank more like this. When I was little, and stupid. I had this film as my second favourite of the four, with Zombie Island as the weakest because I just didn't get it, and it was freaky. One big part of the appeal of this one for me, as I'm sure was for many others, is the fact that it's all about gaming. Yes, gaming, with Scoob and the gang being trapped in a video game with a freaky sweet spooky virus, and they have to get through all the levels in the game to escape the game. While at the time, this was a really neat idea, after all, we just survived Y2K, so technology needed some of its scare factor back, what it ultimately means is the film is just a bunch of unconnected action set pieces flowing into one another with the loose tie of being video game levels. Which, to really be a freak and dissect a 22 year old animated film for babies, the game in the film is meant to be based on the exploits of Mystery Inc, and even I, with quite a bit of Scooby Doo knowledge in me noggin, I can't safely say that Scooby Doo and friends were around during dinosaur times. But 
there is some evidence to suggest it. What this film did present though, aside from some admittedly really neat fan service in the last 20 minutes or so, and a couple of pretty fun montages, was the unique and glaring opportunity to create an actual game to tie in with the release of the film. And the now defunct art... just... Art, it took full advantage, with the PS1 version releasing just days before the film it's based on did in the US, with Europe having to wait until December of that year to get their hands on it. A GBA version of the game was also created by Software Creations, a later rechristened to claim Manchester before shutting their doors entirely. This is a game like Night of 100 Frights that I grew up with but could never quite beat, which we'll delve deeper into why a little bit later. But Weirdly, as I grew up and kept talking about the game from time to time at different points in my childhood, I found that my friends, who had also played the game at different points in their youth, all had the very same, very specific misgivings about very specific points of Scoob's only PS1 outing as I had. So, over a decade on from when I last played the game for my Let's Play back in 2012, what a golden age that was, I reckon it'd be fun to see if those issues we all separately raised are still prevalent, or whether the critical eyes of a bunch of teenagers didn't see things quite as clearly as they perhaps should have. The game actually has a slightly different story to the film it's linked with. In the film, Mystery Inc. go to visit an old college friend at the university he's now working at. He shows them around the campus, but reveals that from one of the video games being developed by one of his colleagues, that a computer-generated ghost, a phantom virus if you will, has spawned and crossed over into reality. They seek to track down this digital demon, with Fred, Velma and Daphne using high-powered magnets to force the freak out of the basement of the college. However, after they lose the virus, who then begins to chase Shaggy and Scooby, the gang reunite only to be tronned by an unknown figure into the video game the virus spawned from. Unable to leave until they beat the game, Mystery Inc. are forced to traverse across various levels to find the end goal of each stage, a box of Scooby snacks. This takes them from the moon to ancient Rome to prehistoric times and many other locations shown off to us in this banging little montage. They run into their in-game counterparts whose outfits are actually all based on the gang's original design. Shout out to Shaggy, who has his reluctant werewolf appearance here. Together, they manage to avoid a cavalcade of classic cretins, among them being Jaguar, the Tar Monster, and the Creeper, again, mainly in the form of a really fun montage with another banging song called Double Double Joint. Look that up, that's it's, it's really good. Before finally managing to defeat the virus and escape the game. The ginger freak who shot them into the game is arrested, and the digital gang wave them off. So, the framework for the story is literally right there, right? Like, go through some levels, avoid the virus, and ultimately escape the game. Well, the video game that came from it, assumedly because it was developed with only the premise of Cyber Chase in mind, actually takes on a slightly different direction. There's only two cutscenes in the game, the opening and ending, and given the lip syncing and up close look at the models these scenes give us, perhaps that's for the best. I'm not one to harp on things like this, especially in PS1 games where 3D was still new, but uh, this isn't an early PS1 game, the 3D isn't that new. Like I said, both the game and the film released the same year, 2001. So while you have two cutscenes in this game that look and animate like this, you also had these boogers coming out the same year, mostly earlier than Cyber Chase's European release date, and looking light years better. All that aside, the first cutscene sets up for the adventure ahead, but this isn't about the gang being trapped in a game, no, in, in this first of events, it's like the gang voluntarily stepped in just to marvel at the fact that they're in a game made about them, and only encounter the virus coincidentally once inside. Now Scooby, like isn't this groovy, we're the stars of our very own video game. Oh yeah, uh, groovy. Like what's going on? I've spread my evil virus all over this game. 
you'll never get past the monsters I've unleashed. After seeing him, the gang decide he can't go on living and task Shaggy and Scooby with chasing him down while Daphne and Fred look at building a trap to stop him. So instead of seeking to escape the game to keep themselves safe, this game is essentially a manhunt for the virus, They're chasing him throughout every area of the game to try and capture him and making everything he does outside of his initial taunting justifiable as self-defense. After tracking him for hours, harassing him, killing his contemporaries and assaulting him, the virus has had enough and tries to chase Shaggy and Scooby out of the game, only to be zapped inside of Velma's PDA, trapping him forever after Fred and Daphne admit they couldn't find anything to trap him with. Fred asks Scooby and Shaggy if they'd still like to be in a video game, and after a heavy day, they tell him no. The gang then proceed to laugh at the two, and we fade to credits after a job well done. Yeah, there isn't a lot of talk about here, and when you look at it literally like we just have there, it's a kind of funny setup, and that's oddly just completely different to the film, but more than anything, it is just an excuse to have a bit of gaming fun. And who doesn't love that, eh? Who doesn't love gaming? Gaming is at the core of this one, so let's have a look at the game beyond that first cutscene. Immediately after Scoob stops flapping his lips, we're dropped into the central hub area, a big circular room where you can run around and see all of the locations you're going to be exploring over the course of the game. Obviously, it's quite clear to see the game's hub takes some major inspiration from Crash's warp rooms, with it being a circular room with a big save screen in the center headed up by a female supporting character, and you're getting warped into the levels you select. But like, I don't know. It's not that big a deal. The warp room's a proper effective little level select, and having this much free access to Velma really makes it all worthwhile, even if she does have a pudding need. Each area here is comprised of two levels and a boss encounter, making for 21 levels overall. So let's have a peek at where we're off to. Each of the levels is, as you'd assume, based on a location from the film. The thing is though, if you've seen the film, you're aware that there's only a few locations that get prominent screen time. Those being the moon, the Colosseum, prehistoric times, and a city and adjacent carnival. There's only five locations there to base levels on, and actually, only four of them are featured in the game, with the moon, the starting level in the movie, not actually being featured at all. So where do the rest of the levels come from, you may be asking? Well, I mentioned that neat little montage, and that's actually where the rest are plucked from, and it's nice to see locations that weren't expanded upon in the film being fleshed out here instead. The movie shows us a giant backyard, the Arctic, an Egyptian tomb, a medieval castle, an underwater level, and Japan. Of these locations, the tomb, Arctic, and Japan were chosen to be fleshed out into full levels, and while these are fine choices, I would have also liked to see how the giant backyard level and medieval settings could have been fleshed out too. This would have also helped really expand the game's length because in total it took me just under two and a half hours to see and do everything the game had to offer except for getting perfect runs of each level where you collect everything. For which there's no reward though so why would I bother unless the game is exceptionally fun to replay and well it, it isn't. So let's get into exactly why this is the case. The first place we get dropped off in from the warp room is um, classic Japan. And it's after a quick call with the gang that we realize. And it's after a quick call with the gang that we realize. And it's after a quick call with the. Reet, let's get this out of the way. The PDA conversations are incessant throughout the game. I can understand them being present here in the first level. Explain some mechanics, teach how to do stuff, that's, that's fine. But this frequently is maddening. It feels like you take a few steps and the sodding phone goes off again. The gang do try and ring you a little less often as the game and level goes on, but there's typically multiple instances throughout every level where you'll be hearing that bloody ringing. I love the dulcet tones of Velma as much as the next guy. In fact, pro probably, probably a lot more, actually. But Christ dear, give me some space! Also, while some of them are optional flavour text, a good chunk of them are going to be the gang calling you to warn you of an upcoming hazard, which you'll want to listen to to give you an idea of what's coming up so you're prepared for it. These break the pace of the levels horribly across the entire game, and while you can't ignore them, again, if it's vital information about an upcoming hazard, you'll want to listen. Now then, where, where was I? 
Right, okay. After a quick call with the gang, we get to control Scooby in an actual level, and allow me to pose a question to you to help you understand exactly what it's like to play this game. Have you ever wanted to play a game of Crash yeah. Bandington where only his bum and bazooka could break boxes and box bunnies oh. loads? If the answer is yes, then first, I don't know what happened to you, but I hope things are better now. Second, bloody hell and third that was a rhetorical question i told you a second ago it was just to help you understand are you not listening to me i don't often like saying oh this game is just x but with y but like that's the best way to describe these levels they're wider crash stages where you can only break objects to get items with a bum stomp and can only hurt enemies with that same rear strike or by throwing pies at them the pie throwing isn't super obtuse to get used to the cursor moves quite quickly and the game usually is quite generous with the herb boxes on enemies, but having to stop and aim every single time as an enemy on screen is just another small break to the pace of the levels. Usually I try and line myself right in front of enemies to get rid of them straight away, meaning I'm not having to spend more time aiming and can just throw and go. But this does mean however that I'm myself more likely to get hit since I'm having to get directly in front of them to keep the pace up. And while this isn't too bad with enemies who just walk at you to attack physically since most them go down in one hit. When it comes to projectile friends who hoist stuff at you like the seals in the arctic and the gladiators in Rome, it becomes a bit more risky to be right in harm's way for the sake of keeping going. This may not seem like much of an inconvenience, but when you compound it with the box breaking I'd mentioned, while the rear end thump isn't as slow as a belly flopping crash, it still isn't as quick as just jumping on them to break them. Above all else, it's just a small inconvenience that's ever present in the game. Maybe Maybe this has you thinking, ah oh, well maybe just try not to break all the boxes then, you said there's no reward for 100% of the levels so just don't do it and yeah this could work until you notice that uh, there's a number next to your pies and you realise that your main attack is tied to a resource. It's finite, and when you run out of pies, it's arse assault only. This means that, at some point, you're gonna have to break boxes to replenish your ammo, or be conservative. <laughs> with how many you throw. And with enemies like these ones we have here who all have rather generous hitboxes, you'll be wanting to clear them out of your way from a distance, especially in instances like these where they directly block your path. Thing is with this though, not every box will contain a perfect punk pulverizing pie. Some will contain extra lives and others health, and while this may be useful, the pies are more useful than any of them in moment to moment gameplay. Replenishing a vital resource like the pie shouldn't feel like a chore or just luck. These are smaller inconveniences, but when they're linked so closely together they mount up quite quickly. Again, not mega frustrating or game breaking, but it slows things down quite a bit. I only completely ran out of pies once or twice during my recording session for this game, but when it's either stop and break the boxes in the hope there might be a pie inside or tank a hit while trying to deal with enemies using your chorus crush, it feels a little unfair. Okay, I've hopped on about the moveset and collectibles enough, let's, let's actually look at the levels we have here. Classic Japan. Starts us off and it's pretty standard stuff for a first area, teaching you the basics of the game, then it's platforming and keeping things simple, and in the second level focus shifts towards introducing combat with a couple of different enemy types. A decently standard stuff, a little slow, a little long. Nothing major though. Then we have Ancient Rome, and let me tell you gang, the opening to the first Rome level, the fourth overall stage in the entire game, is probably the second hardest thing the game has you doing. This game is a platformer, as such you're gonna be jumping over and around hazards, bottomless pits, you know, pretty, pretty common stuff in, in platformers generally speaking. So why is it whenever I talk to my friends about this game, they remembered this level in particular? The opening platforming sequence. It looks fairly simple, just hop across these oscillating pillars and get on with it. But then you add in the eternal enemy of man. A PlayStation 1 depth perception, the fact that Shaggy's drop shadow takes its sweet time to appear, and that jumping is rather committal, even when you're using that double jump with correction. When you panic because your shadow hasn't appeared, it's easy to get yourselves into scrapes. You simply just have to trust that you've made it, and who knows? 
maybe you have, or maybe it's time to rethink the fact that you're 25 and playing and talking about Scooby-Doo. The rest of the level after this area, thankfully, is really neat. Running along a wall while guards pelt you with spears, outrunning a freak on a horse-drawn carriage before the second level takes you inside the Colosseum, having you dodge guards who are just just, just standing there. On your way to the snacks, which is literally just one big long hallway with some missing tiles, making the difficulty of the first area stand out even more because uh, the rest of this level in particular, the second level, really is just rather simple. What also stands out is the level that comes next, purely for the amount of level specific hazards that are contained within it. The first level of the Arctic sees you in a giant ice cave, complete with ice floor slides, pushing walls and a surprising amount of enemies who attack you in pretty coordinated fashion. This level, while being quite bland visually, provides a good challenge that's fair to the player, really putting to the test what you've learned so far. The second stage of the Arctic, however, doesn't do this, instead being the first vehicle level in the game, by which I mean there is only one other vehicle you get to control in the game, and that is within a wider platforming stage. You're sent down a tundra in a flume, having to dodge sliding penguins and a few holes to reach the goal. It's the only pure gimmick level in the game, and it's... it's... it's, 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 it's alright, a bit, bit boring really, the pace of it drags on quite a bit, it's visually pretty uninteresting, it's... 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 it's imagine if... imagine if Sonic 2's half-pipe was 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 its own thing but there's less to do it's less visually interesting and it was a level i used to really get excited for when i was little but now it's it's just sway from side to side every now and then and just keep in the middle for this last bit which i don't know it wasn't great it wasn't horrid which wasn't wasn't very involving. Next up is the prehistoric dinosaur infested jungle where the main selling point of the first level is falling bones and lots of enemies. This is the level where I actually managed to run out of pies, partially because I was simply silly, but then I was forced to tank damage to make it through the level and while I wasn't in any real danger of dying, it was annoying to know my only alternative was to attempt a derriere drop which potentially would have gotten me hurt anyway. Next level is a little nicer though, lots of lovely platforming across dinosaurs Saws, alligators dodging huge rock slides with boulders galore and ro road to nowhere yeah just just straight up road to nowhere I, I know i said this game is like crash but oh yeah lads this one is a lot of fun probably one of my faves in the whole game actually though just some really nice platforming set pieces you know wow the big city this is probably overall my favorite world in the game the skateboard you have is a nice way to break up the running the enemies are just dudes who say what's up as they come past you I like it. And then you get to probably the coolest level in the game with the coolest gimmick. Aside from being especially tight, having conveyor floors and including stealth which summons a large man if you get spotted, this level stands out most of all because the phantom virus himself shows up. You chase him through the hallways and he throws some stuff at you before leaving. It doesn't sound like much and it's pretty short lived but to younger me this blew my mind that he was here and honestly it still has a fair amount of charm now considering that this never happens again. And speaking of things I never want to happen again, the Egyptian tomb world, worst in the game by far for all of the wrong reasons. The first level isn't bad, pretty intense with the amounts of fire and enemies involved, but you know, fine, it's fine, you know, it's challenging, it's getting towards the latter part of the game, that's fine enough. It's the second level, that's pretty heinous. I entered this level with 20 lives and managed to game over because of two specific sections. Uh, by the way, here's the game over screen, the virus seems pretty chuffed, but Shaggy sounds sort of passive aggressive. Yeah, way to go, Scoob! This level has probably the most intense platforming in the game and our old friend Death Perception is back but with this time it brought its mate, Knockback. Knockback isn't just present in this level obviously but in this level it raises its giant ugly stupid head the most alongside its pal. There's two sections in this level that are horrid. The first being this lovely cylindrical throwback to the Roman romp we went on before where Death Perception joins forces with weird platforming hitboxes to mean that Sometimes you simply fall through the platform or don't land. This is then immediately followed up by this section, a long dark hallway with lots of enemies, big boulders rolling down the middle. In any other platformer, 
this would be a pretty exciting end of level set piece. In this game, it's a frustrating slog where all of the issues I talked about in the previous section turn up to 100 with harder to land on platforms which you sometimes, I guess, just fall through. See ya, my fault, I guess. This would have been mitigated so much by having a quick attack to get enemies that who are up close to you, but you don't, you've got your pies and your bum and yeah no, worst level in the game by far, it should be fun but it just isn't, it's, 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 it's horrid, I don't like it, I never really want to come here again, which means because of how horrid this level is, the final two levels feel tame by comparison, actually, they're, they're fun enough. I would say. The first level of the carnival has this charming haunted house area and a pretty nicely lit parade area, it looks really vibrant, with the second level having you zipping around a carnival via catapults with some really nice little timing puzzles required to progress and grab some goodies. Alongside there's a healthy helping of mazes as well and it concludes with this cool little castle section where you scale your way through a tower which is cool and out of every level I think these two do the best job at balancing combat and platforming. Instead of having them feel segregated across two separate stages which is a shame because they're also the last two levels in the game. That's all the main levels the game has to offer and while some of them offer good enough fun a lot of the time they're just a bit boring, like, they're a packet of ready salted crisps, they do a job, but they're no Sunday dinner. But coming back to the game to get the footage, I remembered a few of them from previous times I've played, for reasons both good, bad and benign, like, I remembered Japan because I restarted the game a lot as a kid, I remembered Rome because the beginning is pants, I remembered the Arctic for the flume level, the city because of the virus, and the carnival because I thought the catapults were a neat idea 11 years ago when I let's played this game. The rest of the game though sort of blends together for me a bit. Like, like, there were some standout moments that I've mentioned, but rarely, if ever, did I find myself being like, oh yeah, it's this level. I also noticed that the game seems to split the levels into two different types, long hallways with lots of enemies, and levels which are more platforming based, with the flume simply being an oddity, and when I'm thinking about which levels I like the most, it's obviously the platforming ones, with the other stages being the main contributor to the crisp comments from a moment ago. It also doesn't help that, again, all the way through every level the gang are trying to contact you, which does get great in, and even though I did say earlier it was helpful, I think them telling you, here's what's coming up in the next room, does new the surprise factor of the levels a bit, and makes them a little bit easier. Again, I know this game is designed for babies, but like, come on art, you can trust the babies. If I had to rank the areas, they'd probably go like this, but when I've used language like fun enough and not boring to describe even the best levels in the game, I don't know how good I can say the quality of gameplay we have on the whole here actually is. As I say though, that's only all of the main levels, because of course there's some big bossy boys as well. Each area's got one, and pretty much all of them are lifted directly from the film, with one exception we'll talk about a little bit later. The first one is an undead shogun who... Oh, you bloody joking man! Okay, so at the start of every boss fight, there's some pre-fight conflag between the virus and either Scooby or Shaggy, depending whose turn it is to tussle. Standard. Then, typically, you'll get a call from a member of Mystery Inc. giving you a pep talk. And by pep talk, I mean saying, don't get hit and hit the boss when you can. Class. Cheers. Conversations aside, the first boss is this Shogun fellow, who advances on you to slash with a sword and summons fire spurts throughout the arena. He's a lethargic bugger, so outrunning him with Scooby's breakneck pace isn't much of an issue. Hitting back at him is also no issue because the game literally screams at you when it's time to strike. Look, look, he's out of puff. Take advantage now. A simple enough first fight. The Colosseum's boss doesn't actually grace us with his presence immediately, and it's not until the apple of my eye starts talking about skeletons and lions that we get an idea of what's coming. But where are they? <coughs> oh, hello. This one is neat because it's a combination of the enemies you fought as well as a more powerful boss working together without being a mook rush. The strategy is the same as before, and it's the same for all of the fights except the last one. If you don't stop moving and jumping, you'll be fine. But it's always a bit of a close call with the lion who has some pretty nimble leaps, and whose friends don't take kindly to him being defeated, launching one final attack after you down the lion, and if you're on low health and you get hit, 
you would have to do the whole fight again, but thankfully, I'm Gamer Prime, and I simply know to not get put in that situation. In the Arctic, the virus tries to take matters into his own hands, grabs a spear and a nice fluffy coat, and mounts a polar bear. This fight is fought entirely on ice, but honestly, that's a positive, because Shaggy's running animation is incredible when he's a slipping and a sliding. Lining up pies directly is a bit harder though, given the terrain and the fact that Polar Bear is a big boy, so when he's spinning at you, he's got quite the generous hitbox. This boss is fine though, if only for Shaggy flailing helplessly throughout. Oh, and also this boss gets dizzy instead of breathless, really setting it apart from the others we've seen so far. The next boss is the T-Rex, who, for a big dinosaurus, actually has some pretty bland attacks. He just runs at you and swipes his tail, he causes debris to fall when he's off screen, and... Well, I think it's him who does it. It could just be a natural volcanic calamity. Eventually, he, like all the others, needs his inhaler. Much like the lion boss, though, because of how the characters move in this game, you need to be on your toes dodging, because even if you do do it, it's always a close call. After cream pieing a Tyrannosaurus, the city cements itself as the best area by having the quickest and most unique boss, who actually isn't featured in the film as a prominent villain. The Funland Robot... The Funland Robot. Yeah. ...is a pretty iconic villain from Where Are You, so he makes sense being here. He's gonna use a conveyor belt to disorient you before appearing, having a crisis and dropping bombs on you. He's by far the quickest and easiest boss in the game, but I appreciate not having to wait out a pattern, and the difficulty instead comes from keeping on top of the moving terrain. He's my man, my lovely metal man. Egypt then decides you can't have fun at all while playing it, and decides to also feature the worst boss alongside its two grotten little levels, though it is also the most unique. The virus here is sat on a camel with a lovely scimitar behind a shield that doesn't lower until you kill all the baddies. Not a problem, all the enemies die in one hit and... Oh no... Using your limited inventory of pies, you need to knock the mummies into the abyss to hit the virus, and while this sounds fine, it's just boring, man. Like, knocking them into each other's kind of funny that you go, But by the final heat, you need to dispose of five mummies before you can finish off the boss, and having to constantly maneuver around them to, one, and get a better position to knock them away, and two, actually replenish your pies just gets grating. The boss just isn't fun, and cements Egypt as the least enjoyable part of the whole game. But while I said this boss is the most grating, it isn't the most difficult. And to discuss this next fight, which incidentally is the hardest, I need to give you some context first. Okay, so I first found out this game was a thing from the VHS of the film itself, which I mentioned during my Mystery Mayhem video. E, that was two years ago, can you believe it? E, would it be lush if you watched it again? <laughs> Looking back on this informational video now, it does a pretty good job of summing up the game, giving you a fuller breakdown than your standard trailer would, discussing the amazing obstacles and secret items. Yeah, the secret items that the game has in store for you. Control both Scooby and Shaggy as you battle spooky monsters, avoid Avoid amazing obstacles and discover secret items. Here are some hints and tips to help you along the way. What's interesting though is that clearly this is an earlier build of the game than the final one. Everything environmentally looks quite similar, but then there's some notable differences from the release version we've been looking at, like a different hood placed at the top of the screen instead of the bottom, and this question mark icon appearing whenever you're near breakable objects, slightly smoother turning, and most notably, Scooby's running speed. Looking comparatively at the footage I got from this video and the tips and tricks presentation, Shaggy's movement speed seems relatively relatively unaltered. Maybe he's a little slower in the release? I can't quite tell. Scooby though, when I use the T-Rex boss footage for comparison, is miles slower than the pre-release version of the game, taking ages to get going compared to what you see in the tips and tricks video where he's positively bounding about. Perhaps the developers thought the movement needed to be nerfed to avoid making the bosses too easy, and to be fair it does make the line in T-Rex more intense to dodge, for better or worse. This, however, had a knock-on effect for the final boss, and this is the other part of the game my friends always remembered whenever this game gets brought up. But before that though, the music track this boss has is 
banging. Like, the music on the whole is okay, but this one stands out above the rest. The rest fit proceedings fine, but this one, like, it's, it's, it's just iconic. And I think the reason it's iconic is because I had to play this boss so much as a child. As a child, no matter how hard I tried, this is the reason I couldn't beat the game. The literal final hurdle. When I went back to LP this game in December of 2012, I assumed it was because I was a baby, despite remembering how hard was quite vividly. Four-year-old me evidently had more brains than 14-year-old me because, no, this boss is hard. The other parts of the game I've discussed as being difficult were because of things like depth perception, knockback, or funny platform hitboxes. But the virus is hard for a completely different reason. Scooby's movement speed. Every other boss has a pretty telegraphed attacks designed around the slow movement, so even if it is just by the skin of your teeth, you're always going to be able to get around the attacks if you're careful with the dodges. This is not always the case for the Phantom Virus, who is far quicker than Scoob and moves far more erratically than any other boss, meaning you're going to have to take a few attempts to just memorise how he's going to move before you're going to be anywhere near close to successful. Thankfully, once you know the patterns, the first two phases of the fight aren't massively tricky, even if the virus doesn't tire when it's time to hit him, so you actually have to be competent at timing and aiming to hurt him. What you need to make sure of though is that you're not taking stray hits due to Scooby's long nature, because you need as many hits as you can spare for the final phase. This final attack is, in my estimation, downright unfair. Using his superior speed, the virus will zip towards you and zap you, with you needing to be ready to react and dodge, which is incredibly hard to do because of, again, Scooby's movement speed. And what this means is the final phase of the fight essentially becomes tanking four hits from the virus before he finally tires out to deal the final hit. You can't outrun him because he's faster than you and the attack happens so quickly that I genuinely don't know how you're meant to get around it without being massively lucky. In this recording, I somehow managed to dodge him one time. I literally did nothing different to my other attempts. I just, he just missed me for whatever reason. The boss isn't as egregious as the mummies in Egypt, but it is still by far the hardest part of the game for completely unfair reasons, which is a shame because what is a decently different boss gets completely tainted purely by just how slow Scooby is in this game. I'd rank the baddies like this. Some of them are fine, some of them aren't, but none of them are great. And honestly, I think that's a pretty fine way to describe the game as a whole. Visually, even for a PS1 game, it's a little grim. The music is fine, but there's only one real standout, and the levels and bosses have some fun among them, but are ultimately just okay. I suppose. I had some fun revisiting some of them, like Rome 1, Prehistoric Jungle 2, Carnival 1, and the entirety of the city, but the rest, I was either just frustrated or doing it. It's a proper autopilot game, I guess, if I have to, if I have put it in words. It's, it's something that you just sort of do until something not quite acceptable happens and then you just sort of lean more towards the oh why why what, what am i doing here it's not one of the worst things i've ever played but out of the scoob games i've covered so far i definitely say it's the weakest which actually reminds me the next time we tackle scoob it'll be the last game that i actually grew up playing so yeah um uh, look forward to that i guess um speak to you in a bit